Hello everyone, my name is Chris, and Chris Buell, and I am going to try to do a series of videos playing through a turn or two of Blue Water Navy to show how the game plays out. Um, this is a game about naval combat in hypothetical World War III, either 1983, 85, or 89, and uh, I've come to really enjoy it. Uh, I had a hard time getting my head around the rules, and I have read that other people did too. So I'm hoping this can be helpful. A couple things I'm going to say about these videos. Uh, this first series of them is going to be a little bit rough. I'm probably going to make mistakes. Uh, you're going to hear me paging through the rules and talking about things and asking myself questions. My hope is that after I get these videos done and post them, that some people that have played the game will watch and tell me any mistakes I made. And then I'm going to try to come back and do a video that shows an entire turn uh, played out correctly so that um, anybody else that's having trouble with this can get a little bit of a handle on how to play because I think it's a super fun game and I hope more people will play it. All right, so I'm going to start out with a little overview about the game and the situation that we're in here for this video. So as I said, this is uh, World War III in 1983 in this case. This is scenario number three. It's called Kirovs and Carriers. This game has, what it says it has are five small scenarios, but it actually has uh, closer to ten small scenarios because there are variants to these. These small scenarios just take a small piece of the hypothetical combat and play that out. There's also a campaign game, which is really fun, um, but more complicated than I'm going to get into in these videos. I'm going to just play the small scenario way so that you can see how the different things you're supposed to do in the game get done. So in this scenario, what's happening is it's day five of the war, and the Soviets have launched an amphibious invasion force into the Barents Sea and... That force is right up here. See my cursor moving around. And they're trying to sail that into the Norwegian Sea and then eventually land troops here in Trondheim uh, to capture that city. And uh, the NATO forces are going to try to stop them. So we'll talk a little bit about the different facilities involved and the forces. The Soviets at their Kola Air Base facilities have some strike aircraft. I hope you're seeing where I'm circling the cursor. They have some s strike aircraft over here and also some patrol aircraft. The patrol aircraft, maritime patrol, are primarily going to be attempting to detect NATO task forces and may also be hunting submarines. The strike aircraft are waiting for the task forces to be detected and then they are going to attempt to uh, sink some U.S. ships, particularly carriers. So that's the COLA holding box over here. Up in the Barents Sea, you'll see that there are sea zones, right? The Barents Sea, the Norwegian Sea. This one is just called North 7-8, up at the top here. Um, movement of naval units and air units occurs sea zone to sea zone. The things that are happening on land are abstracted. So up here the Soviets have um, some submarines. These individual counters, you'll see this is a Victor 3. I'll explain what the numbers mean as necessary. Uh, so the Soviets have some lone submarines up here and they've got a bunch of submarines here in the Norwegian Sea and then some more in the northern part of the Norwegian Sea in sea zone north 7-8. Uh, you see the different types. Juliet, uh, this is an interesting diesel sub that also has anti-ship missiles. Uh, there's a diesel Foxtrot, a diesel Echo, or not a nuclear submarine Echo that has missiles. Again, we'll get into all that. Okay, so the Soviets are sailing into the Norwegian Sea, hopefully. They'll get there, trying to launch an amphibious invasion of Trondheim. And the NATO forces are trying to stop them. Up here in Bodo and Narvik, Narvik mainly because this is the a sub, is a Norwegian submarine. Uh, that submarine looks like you'd probably be better off just sticking around in port right there. It doesn't look like coming out's a good idea, but it might. And uh, we've got the Trondheim 
port and Orland Air Base down here in Norway, and there are some units there. There's a sub, and there is a maritime patrol craft. Over here, I'm going to take the, I'm going to hide the units on the screen for a minute. Down here, we have uh, the UK air bases, Stornoway, Lozimouth, and Luchars, Lucars, however you say that. Um, any number of air units can be hosted here. Uh, what's important right now is the, these numbers here, the 1 slash 3. If this air base suffers a single hit, it incurs what's called light damage, and if it suffers three or more hits, it incurs what's called heavy damage. And there are effects uh, based on what kind of damage each airbase has in terms of what it's able to contribute to the fight. Up here in Keflavik, you can see uh, light damage and heavy damage is a little bit easier. Uh, these are airfields and also ports. You see both symbols here. There's the port, there's the airfield, and where these little circles appear shows you what sea zones the facility is adjacent to. So this facility is adjacent, it's on the line here, so Stornoway is adjacent to East 6 and the Norwegian Sea. Lozimath is adjacent to the Norwegian Sea, and Lukars is adjacent to the Norwegian Sea and the North Sea. So an aircraft from this facility can uh, move out of the facility into any of these adjacent sea zones and then begin its movement. Okay, follow me so far, here come the units. So you see light damage with one hit and light damage with one hit, that's a scenario precondition. You determine the damage of those bases ahead of time. What that means is until NATO is able to repair these bases, they won't be able to launch any aircraft from here. Um, the Soviets could theoretically attempt to cause more damage to these bases and make it harder for these aircraft to take part. We'll see if they decide to do that or not. We have the uh, the famous SOSIS lines here. Uh, if submarines cross these, it gives an advantage, which we will talk about as we go. Notice weather marker here. Uh, I have already taken care of the weather for the East Sea Zone. I'm going to in the next video, I'm going to roll the weather for the, Nor for the North Sea so you can see how that works. But bad weather has a bunch of uh, effects on movement and combat. Uh, so we got uh, U.S. subs, nuclear subs here. I'll explain the difference. And here's a British sub um, and a bunch of aircraft down here. So let's talk about the surface units. Surface units in this game can only be at sea if they're part of a task force. When you're playing this game face-to-face, -face, your units in your task forces remain hidden to the extent that they are detected. Uh, so none of these task forces are currently detected. So if we were, I was playing an opponent, uh, I would not have my units and he would not have his units on the map. For solo play and for this, I'm going to leave them out. So let me show you a task force. Here you have a task force moving from right to left. You see TF Andropov. That's the task force marker. That would be the only thing at sea right now if you were playing face-to-face. -face. And then it's got units. The Yak-38, if you're watching this video, you know what they are. Those are fighters. The Minsk is out here. So that's a carrier, and it's also a capital ship. And then down the line, the Soviets have um, an Udaloy, which I'm pretty sure was a destroyer, a really good sub Soviet destroyer. And then they've got a Kinder Group and a Cresta Group, which are smaller ships. And then they've got the Kirov, their big bopper. Again, all these different things that it's talking about, I'm going to explain as we need to. But then at the very end are the Amphibs, and that's important. Because these are the ships that NATO is trying to blow up. They're trying to sink these ships as much as possible before they land troops. And if they do that, they win. And if the Soviets land troops, the Soviets win. The number, the letter S in a circle underneath amphibs is important. That indicates that the ship is slow. And any slow ship in a task force makes that task force a slow task force. And that dictates some of the things that it's able to do and some of the modifiers in combat for and against it. So that's the Soviet task force. Over here, we have some US task forces. Here we have Task Force Ranger. So you notice there's a submarine here. You are allowed to attach one nuclear submarine to a task force, and it is part of it, and that helps the submarine, uh, that helps the task force defend against subs. US-7, in the rules, it says which ship is, which ship numbers represent which class of ships. I don't recall. That might be the Oliver Hazard there. Um, US-1 is another. It's a group of ships, right? And then the Saratoga is a, an aircraft carrier. That's an individual ship. It's a capital ship. And 
on the Saratoga, it has a carrier air group and a an F-14 Tomcat element. And that is its air component. So the carrier air group are the strike aircraft and the Tomcats are the fighters. I know you're all familiar with them. Uh, we'll come over here and look at this other task force here, task force Viking. Uh, slightly smaller task force, only one uh, group of escort ships along with the Enterprise. And so what NATO is going to be doing is NATO is going to be looking to move these task forces into range to engage the Soviets here. Um, I'll explain range when we get there. But basically from this air, from this sea zone here, U.S. task forces will be able to launch strike packages into the Norwegian Sea and attempt to sink Soviet ships. NATO could try to move into the Norwegian Sea ahead of time. You'll see how that works. Um, I think that that is tactically a bad idea for NATO, but I think they might do it just to show you how ship-to-ship -ship combat happens. Okay, so that's basically an overview of this situation. Oh, just down, let me show you in France, there's one, um, one maritime patrol aircraft. Um, so that's the situation. Let's go through the types of units so that you can get a handle on them. So let's start with this maritime patrol aircraft. Uh, this one is an Atlantique. It's French. Uh, or is it Belgium? French. So in the upper right-hand corner, the number two there, that indicates this aircraft's range. So it can fly two sea zones um, and then do what it's going to do. The, the one and three... For this aircraft. The one is the number of dice it rolls when it's attempting to detect a task force. More on that later. And the three are the number of dice it rolls when it's attacking, when it's hunting and attacking Soviet submarines. And the number 10 is its defense. If it's being shot at by an enemy fighter or surface to air missile, a 10, a modified 10, will cause a step loss. Most units here are two step units. Uh, we're going to go over here to some fighters. The different fighters have different numbers, but this is an F-4 Phantom based in Britain. And so you see the 8 is its defense, okay, and it's called a fighter. The, the 2 is its range in C zones, and the 3 is the number of dice that this unit rolls in air-to-air -air combat as a baseline. There are modifiers to that. And the plus 1 is its tactical value, which indicates that it rolls, that it's all of its die rolls are modified with plus one automatically. Um, let me I'll compare this to the Soviet fighters here. You see the Yaks. The Yaks have a range of zero. That means they can only fly around where their carrier is, and they only roll one die in combat, and they have no tactical modifier. So these planes are not very effective compared to NATO planes, right? We know that. Um, Here's another type of MP unit. You'll notice that it has a range of one, so they're not all the same. Here's a strike aircraft. Uh, so these are Buccaneers, based out of Britain. So again, a defense of eight. And the numbers in the upper right-hand corner, the two is its range in sea zones, and the six are the number of anti-ship missiles that it can fire, or the number of bomb dice it gets if it attacks a land facility, which it can only do through bombing. NATO aircraft do not have um, air-to-ground strike missiles, I think, except through card play. Um, and now, just for comparison, some F-15s. They've got a defense of nine. They roll two dice, but their modifier is plus two. So you see the way that these units are modeled. Uh, let's talk about a submarine here. Um, we'll start with a diesel sub. So the D in the circle means that this is a diesel submarine that affects what it's allowed to do. The two and the four are its attack values. The two are how many dice it rolls if it's hunting subs, and the four are how many dice it rolls if it's attacking surface units in a task force. And the nine is its defense. Uh, over here we have an Echo 2. So this has an eight defense. It rolls two dice in attacks against submarines or against surface units. If there's only one number, that's just sort of its ability to engage other units. The three in the black is a is the number of missiles it fires. These are missile submarines, and they can attack with missiles against ships or against land units or against uh, facilities. They don't you don't attack the units, you attack the facility. Um, uh, down here we got a. Um, 
the Daphne. So you see the S there. So this is a slow sub. It's a little bit less effective, but it does roll four dice against surface units. So that's not bad. I'll show you. Um, okay, here's the here's the Victor three, probably the best sub in the game for the Russians. You see the plus one in the black square. That is its tactical value. The T is a indicates that it shoots heavy torpedoes. That's a combat modifier. Its defense is 10, and it attacks with three dice. Uh, you can compare that to the, say, the Los Angeles. Notice that the 10 defense is circled on the Los Angeles, and over here on the Victor, they both have a 10 defense, but the Victor's defense is not circled. That is really important. If, you're, if the submarine's defense number is circled, that means it has the ability to try to save against any hit. So if you attack the Los Angeles and you score a hit, the Los Angeles gets to roll the die to try to save and sort of negate that hit to escape or evade. It's got a plus one tactical, three torpedoes, right? So NATO subs are pretty good. Here is a, here's a NATO sub, that the Sturgeon that cannot save. Here's a British sub that cannot save. Okay, enough of that. Let's talk just a little bit about uh, surface units here. The Soviets have pretty bomber surface units. Um, so uh, take a look at the Sov Udaloy unit. That is representative of a lot of what we need to know. The number three in the circle, that is always your anti-submarine value. So when it's fighting off submarines, it uses that three. Uh, the R means it has rocket torpedoes. That's a modifier for combat that is very helpful, actually, uh, in practice. The upper right corner, the, the four, the white four, those are anti-ship missiles that it can fire at task forces uh, if they're in the same zone. The red three is a kind of missile that doesn't come into play in the small scenarios. They're only used in the campaign. Uh, I can't recall what they are. The three, the black three in the upper left, that is its SAM value. So when it, when this task force is being attacked by missiles, this ship contributes three points to its total surface-to-air missile value. And what you do is you add them all up and some stuff happens. I'll explain that. Um, I think that that is all we need to know. Those numbers are pretty straightforward. And uh, so I think I've covered what I'm hoping to cover for this video. Uh, I'm going to stop here so that these videos don't get too long, and I'm going to start again at the beginning of the turn, and we're going to walk through a turn and see how I do with getting the rules right.